when I was my sister's age, just 12 years old this year, I didn't have many worries. And it's funny because my baby sister, the Nai, she's an American citizen, so it should be easier for her. But it hasn't been. Because the people she loves the most, my mom, our other sister, Beba, and I, we're all undocumented. And when we're threatened, she's threatened. My baby sister was forced to bear the burden of attacks on immigrants under the Trump administration. I remember election night 2016, my mom and I were in complete shock trying to absorb what had just happened to the country, trying to strategize about how to handle certain possibilities. I remember frantically Googling, what happens to a US citizen child if an undocumented parent is deported? My dad died young, so I needed to assure myself that if anything happened to my mom, if she was deported, I could get custody of the Nai, who at the time was only eight. But then of course, what would happen if our other sister Beba and I were both deported? Our mom and I totally lost track of time during our election night panic. So hours later, I came downstairs and I was surprised to find my baby sister, the Nai, wide awake, sitting in a corner by herself, crying, red face with puffy eyes. And with my dad gone, I've always had to be the big brother or rather father figure since our mom was always working. I helped Danae with her homework. We read each other bedtime stories, play games. I try to answer those unanswerable kinds of kid questions and comfort her when she's scared. But I wasn't used to trying to comfort her when in reality, I needed so much comforting myself. I remember tilting her chin, listening with tears toward me looking into those deep brown eyes and trying my best to give her soothing answers to difficult questions. Just repeating, don't cry, baby, don't cry. It's gonna be okay, I promise. It's gonna be okay. Listen, why would you be deported? Do you even know what that word means? You shouldn't have to. Now listen to me, you are an American citizen and you will never be deported. You're right, I'm not a citizen, but I've got DACA. They can't deport me. And I know mom doesn't have DACA, but mom is gonna be okay. She's lived here for decades. She's not going anywhere. Baby, don't cry, please. I promise, whatever happens, we'll be together, always. I'll be there to put band-aids on your scraped knees. I'll be there to help you finish your school projects. Yes, we're gonna finish reading Harry Potter together. And I'll be by your side when you need help applying for college. I'll be by your side. I'll be there for you when you fall in love for your first time, when your heart is broken. And I'll walk you down the aisle one day. And it really doesn't matter where, as long as we're together. Yes, of course, the puppy's coming with us if we go. Lulu's part of this family too, I'll have you know. Yeah, that's the dimply smile I like to see. It's gonna be okay. At least, at least that's what I told her. I did my best to offer her what I wanted to hear, what I wanted to believe, both for her and our entire family. Because how do you talk to a child about being taken away from their parent or siblings without terrorizing them, without stripping them of their innocence. And with each day of the Trump administration, the increased deportations of parents like my mom, the attempts to end the DACA program that protects me and my sister Beba, the willingness to end rules that limit how long children can be detained, and even threats to strip children like the Nai of their citizenship. With all these mounting threats, it felt increasingly cruel to offer my baby sister what amounted to be a fairy tale, when in reality she needed great strength to overcome, overcome great threats. So this morning I offer her and you another story. And this story won't kiss it and make it all better, but I'm hoping it'll help us stay strong regardless of the challenges that we might face. I was just three years old, and our other sister, Beba, was just one when we crossed the border with our mom. 
We walked together with a group of people, maybe 10, 15, across the desert. Walked for hours and hours at night. I remember we were out in the middle of nowhere following some dim silver light in the distance. I imagined we followed it because it meant we were going the right way. Some shining city in the distance. We finally got to a raised road lined with street lamps. And to avoid walking over the road that night and potentially being seen, we crossed through a drainage tunnel under the road. Mom had me walk through the tunnel in front of her as she crawled behind with my sister in her shawl. Bev and I, we were wearing those little kids' slide-up shoes everybody was going crazy over that year. Mom had saved up, the, saved up a lot of money to buy them because we were going to be seeing our dad after a year of him being in the U.S. on his own. So she wanted us to look our best. And those shoes, they're actually super helpful in that drainage tunnel to light the way for mom and all the other people crawling through on their hands and knees. But of course, in the dead of night, in the middle of the desert, they were a dead giveaway. We were finally able to see the moonlight at the end of the tunnel and catch a whiff of fresh air when the coyotes urgently requested that my mom take off my shoes. There's a border patrol car parked outside, he whispered. The drainage tunnel emptied out right next to a gas station where a border patrol car was parked. The officers were inside, we assumed, so we waited for a while, hoping they'd return to their car and drive away. But nobody was coming out, and for some reason, the coyotes grew impatient, abruptly told everybody to move. In the chaos, everybody immediately scrambled, crawling behind tall grass on their hands and knees, as the coyotes gave us voiceless commands with their fingers on their lips and pointing to the ground. The ground was covered in cactus thorns and prickles, and I didn't have any shoes. And while everyone else crawled, my mom stood up, carrying both Peba and I in her arms, and she just started walking. And at first, at, at first, I thought she was giving up because we'd surely be seen. I mean, everybody else was still crawling on the ground, but she stood up tall and walked with a defiant Peba in her step, as if she belonged right there where she stood. And that's when I realized she hadn't given up. She just had faith that walking quickly and quietly was her best strategy to protect us. She was resolved that somehow, somewhere, we would be okay and that we would find somewhere to call home where our family could thrive. And I've never forgotten the look on my mom's face as she walked out into the darkness of an unknown country. That is when I first learned the real meaning of courage is not to pretend to be immune from fear, but rather to calmly and steadily take action in spite of it. And our former president and his followers, they caricature my little three-year-old self as a diseased toddler, criminal, murderer, rapist, gang member in the making. They try to scare people who don't know any undocumented immigrants into thinking that a mother carrying her children to safety is nothing less than an invasion. But my sister Beba and I, we grew up beloved by our friends, our neighbors. We grew up to be strong members of our communities. We both went to college and I even became student body president of my university. I'm not part of some invading army fighting against America, but like many of you, I'm fighting for the American ideals I know we can live up to. They may want to take away my baby sister's right to citizenship, but I remain hopeful that Maybe the Nai or some other young woman in this audience today might be our future president and help lead us to a future where we actually live up to our ideals to truly have liberty and justice for all. But that reality is going to take a lot of hard work and not just on my part or on the part of the immigrant community, but on your part too. Every single one of you. As Anne Frank once said in her famous diary, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Thank you. I am playing Las Manos de Mi Madre, My Mother's Hands, in honor of Christian's mother. And here are a few lines in English that express a verse that I'll be singing. For me, my mother's hands represent an open sky, a memory I yearn for, warm clothes in the winter, 
they offer themselves with strength. They offer themselves with the strength of her love, noble, sincere. What might the hands look like of people who use them not because of love, but because of hate? Las manos de mi madre me representan un cielo abierto y un recuerdo añorado, trapos calientes en los inviernos. Ellas se brindan calidas nobles, sinceras, limpias de todo. Como serán las manos del que las mueve gracias al odio. Las manos de mi madre llegan al patio desde temprano. Todo se vuelve fiesta cuando ellas vuelan junto a otros pájaros, junto a otros pájaros que aman la vida y la construyen con el trabajo. Are de la leña, harina y barro. Lo cotidiano se vuelve mágico. Se vuelve mágico. Se vuelve mágico. Se vuelve mágico. Oh, 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 oh. 